Oh, we're doing another book club. All right. Uh, Sean, are we doing like a Rick Remender, Jonathan Hickman dealie today? Not today. Oh, uh, uh, are we doing a reader's suggestion? Is that it? Nope. Huh. Uh, Pete, uh, are we doing like an, uh, an Invincible? Or are we doing Spider-Man? No, not today. Well, what about Kale? Swapping, uh, bitch! Oh, oh, oh no! <laughs> Yo, listeners, prepare your booty holes. Oh, oh no. God. <laughs> <laughs> I am pumped. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as Phil alluded to, we are not doing any of those trash comics. We're doing a good comic. One called Swamp Thing. <laughs> For anyone that didn't hear that, uh, Marcus Fiance heard that and said in the background, oh, oh no. Wow, annihilated by your own fiance, man. Harsh. Bro. Brilliant. All right. Well, then, we'll have more than just four people to prove wrong. Huh? <laughs> um, no, but I'm super pumped for this. Uh, this has been actual years in the making um today we'll be reading swamp thing it's going to be the alan moore run at the very start of that so issues 20 through 34 plus the annual number two uh we've skipped over uh, issue 32 for the purposes of this it's kind of like a filler issue um and you can actually get this in two trades the saga of the swamp thing uh, or uh and volume two love and death or the new absolute hardcover that actually came out. And uh, I've been notified that it's actually, they, they've recolored some of that. So if you guys are interested or already fans and have read this stuff, but sort of want to do that um, and, and check mm. out the the new recolored version, please go do that. I'm I'm definitely excited to do that. I had no idea that this happened. Um, one of the listeners in a Discord mentioned it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to picking that up at some point. And much like the listeners who reach out to us on Discord, if you want to reach out to us, hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at the Comics Pals. Email us any questions that you have, the Comics Pals at gmails.com. The last two book clubs were a lot of fun, Killer Be Killed, uh, as well as Earth X, which was actually a listener request. And if you want to get a listener request in, hit us up at any of those channels, or uh, probably the easiest way to get to us is uh, the Discord. Um, we you know have a lot of great conversations there about the, uh, the book clubs as well as you know anything else topical um comics wrestling aminés an aminé aminé read your animes and watch your mangas um so with that we can jump right into this doozy of a muck and crusted episode uh <laughs> this series is largely written by Alan Moore it has features art from Stephen Bissett, John Tottlebin, colorist Tatiana Woods, and letterer John Costanza. There's some help and filler stuff here from Sean McManus, Tom Yates, and Alfredo Alcala. Now, before we get right into it, I do just want to give some like context around Swamp Thing. Um, obviously, I'm a huge fan, but prior to this run, the book was a, so this is like issues one through uh, 19. They had actually relaunched this series because Wes Craven was coming out with the movie back in the 80s so they're like oh this would be a great thing to sort of launch the book um you know we'll get a lot of buzz around it and um it wasn't performing that great it was sort of a like by the numbers monster of the week horror book it was largely written by Martin Pasco there were some alternate artists Tom Yates was one of them uh largely featured and the editor had actually been Len Wein, so the original creator. Obviously, he, he made it, so he wanted to sort of oversee the story and the narrative and make sure that it kind of flowed the way that he kind of wanted to. But by issue 15, um, you know, the book wasn't doing well. And so he decided, you know, let, let, let's change it up. Let's look for, let, let's look for writers elsewhere. And, and obviously, this was the start of the sort of British invasion in comics um, with Alan Moore. And... He, at the time, Moore was working on 2000 AD. He started making a name for himself with Miracle Man um, here in the States or Marvel Man in the UK. And V for Vendetta, we had just started at Warrior. Mm. Um, and this book ended up being a, uh, a huge critical success. Uh, the Jack Kirby Award winner 
for best continuing series from 85 to 87, as well as the best writer from 85 to 87. So like uh, it, it managed to really turn the book around uh, in a really, I think, very special way. Um, and, and with that, I mean, uh, sort of bouncing off from the history, I know that a lot of you guys don't really have a history, except maybe Sean. Um, you read the the Charles Soul and like the um, Scott Snyder Scott stuff, right? Snyder, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I was a big fan of all that. I thought it was great. I, I so I wanted to ask, like, how did this compare to to your first of all your understanding of the character? Um, like, did did you coming with that knowledge help this reading at all? Probably. Um, I think that the way it opens. I feel like there's definitely some kind of knowledge you have to have to fill in the blanks a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I felt like knowing Swamp Thing from those runs that you mentioned helped me to, to kind of more quickly adapt myself to what was going on than I might have been able to if I didn't have that experience. Got it. And, and how did you feel about the book overall? Like obviously having that knowledge, how did, how did you feel that the, the, the book sort of came across for you? Oh man, I, I, you know, I, I hate to say this, but I thought it was brilliant. Bitch! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Truly hate to say it. <laughs> yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, you can tell how much, the runs that you mentioned, the Soul and Snyder run, were inspired by this. Yeah. Um, I don't know what other Swamp Thing runs are like, but this, I get the feeling this is like the definitive Swamp stuff. And it felt like they were trying to play to Alan's tune. And, um, but this is, this was the cream of the crop in a lot of ways. Uh, I, I can't wait to, to dive in more, but from from every level, on every conceivable level, this book really just knocks it out of the park. Cool. Uh, you guys? I mean, yeah, yeah. My, my first thought uh, reading it was, you know, why hasn't anyone ever told me this was good before? You know, like uh, I... I'm sorry, wait. We have a podcast that we've been doing... I want to say four years now. Yeah, no, but I, I just mean like you would think that in those four years that somebody would have been like, you should read Swamp Thing. It's really good. But like no one has ever tried to sell me on it, you know, but it's like this really, really great, you know, I think uh, hidden gem, you know, and uh, I I have to say, Marco, I don't I don't know what motivated you to pick it, but I'm glad that you did. Uh, yeah. Cause I, I, book. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I really, really I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, and I. You know, I thought I might going into it because obviously, you know, I'm a fan of Alan Moore and um, particularly this era of comics are, are you know, uh, pretty near and dear to my heart. And, you know, I think this is a book that um, is, I guess, like a gap for me in that way because, like, I am a fan of Alan Moore and I have read a lot of the seminal books from this period because that vibe really speaks to me. But despite the fact... Um, that I've had you, Marco, and also um, my good buddy Jared, who's one of my closest friends who reads comics. Um, oh, man. Yeah, has been uh, trying to sell me on this book for, for years and years and years. And, like, finally getting into it, I was like, oh, wow, yeah, this is 100% my shit. Um, it's definitely a comic of its time, but, like, in all of the best ways. Um, so, overall... Really, really excited to jump into it. I, 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 I thought it was a great read. Uh, yeah, it's it, it, yeah. Um, I, I thought Doctor Theodore Salas was really sympathetic. I think Steve Gerber did a really good job writing this. You know, Marvel, they really know how to hit out of the park sometimes, right? <laughs> Amazingly, yeah. Um, no stupid man thing joke. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> It, it was um yeah it was it was excellent um it had a quality that i i really enjoy in 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 fiction of, of it felt like a fever dream at points in many points mm. honestly uh i i get kind of enraptured by by something like that it, it it plays with your own kind of cognitive experience and um 
you know, I, I had never read it, obviously. Um, I've read a lot of Alan Moore's um, DC books, obviously. Uh, this was this was a big hole in my in my in my comic book reading. And at points it reminded me of things like Animal Man by Grant Morrison. Yeah. Um, in a very flattering way. Uh, I'm really I'm really glad to have read this and I'd like to read more. Alan yeah. Moore. <laughs> Jesus and, Christ, that and, was uh, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, I respect it. I respect it, Phil. I respect it. Thank um, you. So we had two actual um, listener questions. We you know we posted those up in the Discord. Um, one came from actually aforementioned Jared um, on the Discord, Jman313. And I wanted to start with this one because this was actually a question that I oh, had. Wait, that's not Jared. Is it not? That's that might be oh. a Jared, but that's not my Jared. Oh, then I lied. Then uh, it's just Jman three one three on the on the Discord. <laughs> um, but he he asked, um, how friendly do you feel that Moore's Run is for new readers, as it's heavily steeped in continuity? I think Sean sort of mentioned that you know it, that sort of knowledge probably helped him a little bit. Um, and he said, particularly with uh, the character Arcane, we'll, we'll obviously get into like a little more detail. But I wanted to understand from you guys like how. How easy was it to step in considering that it opens on like this immense aftermath of a battle? Listen, I, I know very little about Swamp Thing lore. Uh, the only reason I remembered the name of his love interest is because it was beaten into my head during our 200th episode. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's no lie. That's the only reason I remember her name so vividly. I was like, oh, I oh it's her. <laughs> that's, right. that's the one. If you if you don't know what I'm talking about, listen to our 200th episode. Um, yeah, I didn't know who his primary antagonist was up to this point. Uh, th- I went into this cold. There were things I had heard about this uh, this particular run from other people talking about it in like uh, podcasts and stuff, other creators, I mean. But I didn't know anything, and at no point did I feel lost in the lore of it. Um, mm-hmm. No, it is. It's 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 sophisticated writing, and there's long sections of, of prose. But that you know, that's not, you know, that that's not something that would be lost on a, a new comic book reader. That just requires a certain reading level, I'd say. Mm. Yeah. Um, I would similarly. I I went in with no knowledge. Uh, I I think the only actual Swamp Thing title I've ever read is the Winter Special that we reviewed on the show. Yeah, like a few oh, yeah. years ago. Um, so my my familiarity with the character is like very very limited. Most of it comes from you know from friends. Uh, so I I didn't know who any of those players were, and I think if you're a new reader to comics in general, I wouldn't say that it's new reader friendly because I think that would be jarring. But I think as someone who understands what comics are and how they operate, knowing that I'm coming in in the middle of a monthly book that already had history that I didn't know and wasn't going to look up, I assumed that there would be some things I didn't understand and that if they were important, they'd be contextualized for me. And they were. So I definitely feel like you might come off that battle and be like, oh, like, what's going on? But, you know, it's like it's like anything that's serialized. Once you pick up and you start paying attention, like, you'll get there. Right. Yeah. And, and I love that you mentioned that it's um, like for, for maybe like a new reader, it's not ideal. Um, Cause funny enough, I, I was a, a brand new reader to, to comics when I started this. So I, I immediately felt that impact. I was lost beyond belief. I, I didn't like that first page. I didn't even know that it crossed the whole page. Like I thought it was, I was still reading like the, that opening as one page and then one page I'm like, wait, this wording doesn't make any sense. I'm confused. Like, um, <laughs> so, so to that, it's absolutely, uh, you need to have some of that prior comics reading to be able to, I think, get into the flow um, and then sort of uh, continue along with that story. Yeah, Being that's a, a good point. Too. Guy that you are, you were reading right to left, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, someone's like, "What the sure. hell's going on? Why are they, this is stupid." <laughs> Americans read read backwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely think that the book is like, I think it's advanced. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's advanced comics, um, and I don't think that that like, I don't think that means that it's like hard to get into. I just think you know, if you don't have some familiarity with page flow and stuff like that you could get lost in some of the narration and stuff 
you know yeah. um some of the stuff is like pretty out there i can definitely say i'm glad that i read this later on in my uh comics reading i would have hated this if i had read it <laughs> within the first like two or three years of me being a fan i i i, I do think that it's too much for a person who's not very well initiated in comics. Mm -hmm. um, you were younger. You, than well, yeah. I mean, I was 15. Um, but, you know, at, at, at three years later, I was 18. And I think if I had read this mm -hmm. at 18, I would have been still a little bit put off. Um, it was a lot easier to get into Ultimate Spider-Man in the middle of wherever that was than uh, I think this. But if yeah. you are willing to do the mental legwork, uh, there's there's definitely a lot to like and, and a lot to enjoy. But um, to that, I feel like there are things that happen in the book that are better if you have more experience. Like when Etrigan appears or when Dead Man or the Spectre, those are moments you really cannot appreciate at all if you don't know those characters. And that takes yeah. time. Yeah, and, like, I don't know any of those characters. Like, I, I'm familiar with them, like, by, you know, name or by sight. Like, I've seen Etrigan before, but I didn't know his name, and I didn't know what his deal was. Um, and the Spectre is a character where, like, if you showed me a picture of the Spectre, I'd be like, that's a Spectre, but I don't know anything about <laughs> what his deal is, you know, at all. Yeah. <laughs> Marco, this was one of the first comics you read, though, right? Am I crazy for thinking that? No, yeah, this that. is one of the, yeah, the, the, the first, like, comic that it was a serialized thing that wasn't like a graphic novel um so, and, was it hard for you to get into yeah yeah it, it was he, it just was hard to get he told this story uh, he just I, apparently i'm stupid okay he literally was just like i was totally lost and this is the first thing i read and i was confused that was how we started this whole thing fine that's cool i was thinking about what i was getting for dinner apparently all right okay <laughs> great my so, bad so the, the um, what what Moore does and what he's sort of tasked with in the like the first two issues, um, and aptly the first issue number twenty is called Loose Ends, right? He's just wrapping up the previous storyline. He's cleaning house. Um, he's getting rid of some of these characters. Um, as of right now, there's there were like six major ones: um, Matt Cable, Abby Arcane, a Alec Han Swamp Thing, and then um, Sunderland, which. Um, we'll get into like a little bit more, as well as Liz Trayman and Dennis Barclay. Um, so what he does is he he sweeps he sweeps them. Like within this issue, a, a large portion of them are gone. Um, specifically, Liz and Dennis. They don't actually show up until like later on in the series, so you don't really like need to know anything about them. But that really confused me at first. I remember I was like, "Oh, what's up with those two? Are they coming back?" Like, what, like, like they were introduced on like the first page, and I thought they were going to be important, and then they're just like, "No, no, fuck these people." I'm like, oh, all right, okay. They they laid out a uh, an interesting thread, um, uh, an interesting theme in the book that I wanted to explore a little bit later. Um, particularly what one what uh, Liz says which is um, you know after they it opens on them having had sex and and they um, and Dennis is kind of like oh you know we're gonna build a future together whatever and Liz says that you know no we can't do this you know all we have are the horrors in our life um, and that's something that I think permeates throughout the the relationships of the books mm. um, and obviously in particular the the sort of like quasi love triangle Matt cable, and uh, Abby Arcane as well as Swamp Thing. But that starts to get explored later down the line. Here, after he's moved everybody along, um, Swamp Thing's captured by Sunderland, who is this, uh, this corporate CEO who basically wants his power to build the bioresorted formula, which is what, Swamp Thing, what Alec Holland had been trying to create in the, in, in the swamps before he was assassinated. And, um, and then typical alan moore fashion he like literally <laughs> breaks the character down um you know he he's known for his deconstruction uh, i was curious about what you guys felt with his with that um that technique being applied rather than like to a genre but to this character in particular so issue 21 is the autopsy and specifically deals with him literally breaking him apart and rebuilding him I found that to be really useful as a new reader. Yeah. Um, for someone who 
I don't really have any relationship to Swamp Thing aside from, like, having an understanding of, like, who he is and how powerful he is, you know? Like, so I think having an issue that was, you know, kind of like, um, like you said, it was like a, like, like a, a deconstruction of the character and, like, kind of giving you some important beats about him. Like, I, I, felt, I felt like that was very grounding, where, like, the first issue, you know, felt... Like, I got into it because I thought that the scene of him getting in that dog fight was really cool. And I was like, oh, yeah, like, I like the vibe of this. But it it left me feeling kind of like, where is this coming from and where is this going? Whereas yeah. this issue very much I felt like kind of established, like, this is this is the vibe of this run. And this is the, the tone we're going for moving forward. And that, like, really helped me settle into it, I think, as a reader. That first beat. Yeah, and, like, it established, like, a lot of the kind of devices that would be used throughout the book um, later, like, having kind of, like, the narration, like, that isn't in boxes, like, in between margins and stuff like that. And just all these little things that started kind of coming together, you know, or, like, that I noticed came later kind of spiral out of this issue of, like, oh, this is this is how this book feels. Right. I this was one of my favorite issues of the run. I thought this was tremendous. Um, it, it deals with a lot of the things that you would think Swamp Thing would be about. It has a corrupt, you know, businessman who, you know, thinks he knows every. He he simultaneously admits he doesn't know everything and thinks he knows everything. Yeah. Um, and he thinks he's too good to understand what Swamp Thing is, you know, and I took that as, uh, I guess, an allegory for the way that a lot of those types of people think about nature. And he had no clue what he was really dealing with. Uh, and I really liked that. I like the Woodrow, or not Woodrow, I, I did like the Woodrow character a lot, but um, also the, the other, yeah, Sunderland. Um, and then also, I thought that this was a great sort of, I guess, introduction into Swamp Thing. I don't know if these were new ideas at the time, like the idea that he only looks the way he looks because he thinks he should, not because that's how he is. Um, the idea that Alec Holland is dead and has been dead since the uh, explosion uh, and that Swamp Thing is just kind of thinking he... He, he the only part of Alec that still lives is like the consciousness that Swamp Thing has absorbed. I thought that was really crazy. And um I don't know how much of that was actually like in this specific issue. But yeah. So that that is specifically Alan's Mora his Moore's idea. Um previously he was just a man transformed into like the Swamp Thing, right? So basically th there was always this chance that he'd be able to come back. He'd be able to return he'd be able to become a man again. And that was basically the beats of the, the first series, as well as the, um, like the first few issues of the, the second series. But this is where Almore was like, that, that's not what this is. This character is something else completely. I see. Yeah, and I, I thought that was like, that really connected me to him emotionally. Yeah. You know, yep. because it, it, it very much... Um, I don't know I, I like I like Alan Moore's take on him as like this like almost like Frankenstein like figure you know where like he's this you know um, this moral monster you know who's like gentle and has this you know this way about him that's like you know almost like poetic you know and that like he's just like clinging to a humanity that never really even existed you know and like yeah. that that whole thing really uh, I don't know it just it's it's heavy in a way that's not like edgy and I yeah. really like that you know like it, it's emotionally weighty but it's not it's not so like yeah he was murdered but that's not like what it's about right like that that's not the sad part isn't that he died it's that he thinks that he didn't you know right. um, that's nuanced in a way that a lot of you know books are not um not even necessarily not interested in, but not able to do just because the nature of the character doesn't allow for it, right? Like, it makes a really interesting use of what Swamp Thing is. Um, 
Pete kind of alluded to it, but I think this early part uh, of this particular story arc really delves into uh, the nature of humanity. Mm-hmm. I, I guess underscore nature. Um, so when when Swamp Thing is being vivisected by uh, uh, the Pharaonic man, um, you find out that all his vital organs aren't vital after all. Um, which I thought was that was that was crazy, and it really dehumanized the character, yep. in a literal way. Um, and then when Swamp Thing discovers his notes, Floronic Man's notes, that's when he learns uh, the apparent truth. And Pete, you talked about how he was like Frankenstein. This was a Frankenstein moment where he takes revenge, and not, not like he takes revenge on, on, on his loss of innocence, you know. Um, and so the follow-up issue is what really like that issue in itself was great, but the follow-up issue was great where it really delved into uh, Swamp Thing's kind of emotional journey. Mm -hmm. And the one thing he's clutching on is the the remnants of his humanity. Um, and it comes up the skeleton. Yeah. And it comes up again later when he's talking about how deep can you bury the past when he's confronted by kind of Alec Collins ghost, but uh, in this issue where where he's lugging around the skeleton and, and kind of like the remains of his wife, Linda, uh, I really appreciate kind of the, it's like an allegory of, of, uh, an, uh, of an identity crisis. Mm-hmm. Like who is Swamp Thing? Uh, all the while, you know, Floronic Man is also losing his humanity, literally. And that's a it's juxtaposed really excellently. I think in the in the first issue twenty, it's it sort of um, mentions you know Arcane was somebody who gave up his own humanity, and this is reflected in a lot of the characters that something sort of comes face to face with. Um, and Woodrow being that that really good example is is that you know he he envies Swamp Thing for that loss of humanity um, because that's sort of what he sees in him. Um, which is what he wants to see in, in, in himself because he's after what, uh, you know, what Sunderland was after, what Arkane was after was, was that sort of power. But really the, the, the irony there is that Swamp Thing is just a tragic figure who wants to be human and happen to come under the circumstances of not being one. It, it, it's a thing that's echoed a lot in, in Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Data is a character who's an android who is not doesn't have the capacity to experience emotions of any kind but he wants to be human it's mm-hmm. like a pinocchio thing and swamp thing himself is not in like a pinocchio type thing where like he, he strives to have uh for the most part in this uh, until he doesn't he he strives to have some kind of humanity one of the things that that more does a lot is the the arcs as well as the individual issues have this sort of motif so like 22 for example has uh was like swamped it gets repeated it, it and it it's done so to sort of emphasize each of the individual characters so like abby arcane for example she's feeling overwhelmed at the loss of the house or running away a husband that doesn't love her um uh Holland is obviously in his own head trying to figure out what he is and if he is, which I thought was the the craziest question. Um, and then uh, Woodrow is swamped in that he he wants to attain something that is unattainable because he has to lose himself in that. In um, in another in in. Uh, in the subsequent issue 23 another green world you know we're we're introduced into this uh, metaphysical realm the the green um i was curious what was what did you guys feel about that like was that um how did you guys sort of understand the green and the role that swamp thing's consciousness played in that um i kind of had a familiarity with the green beforehand um okay. It, it, I I uh, I like Captain Adam, who's a character who's tied to the quantum realm, mm-hmm. and I've seen people talk about kind of these uh, quantum physical realms in DC Comics, and Swamp Thing is connected to the Green realm, as it were. And so, but I, obviously, I don't have any relationship to Swamp Thing. Um, my interpretation is it's basically all botanical life on 
Earth and and Swamp Thing is like the um, uh, like the golem for is is like a is like the specter for that kind of thing. He um he he's his consciousness as does like the plant life is a consciousness. I think was a really interesting concept because he's able to sort of remove himself from the body, um, uh, and and it, it that starts to play into his acceptance later on, um, where he starts to sort of realize that he can be he can be outside of a body but still like exist. He mm-hmm. doesn't need that that attachment. Yeah, what I thought was <clears throat> was uh, particularly cool about the way that Moore introduced the idea here was that you get um, Swamp Thing's experience with it and him not being human and actually being, you know, a, a sentient plant. Like, he has this perception of it that, you know, he's, like, coming to understand it as we as a reader are. And then I felt like my understanding of it was cemented when that was then kind of contrasted by the way that, um, uh, what is it, the Floridian Man? Uh, Woodrow, uh, for Floronic, Floronic, Floronic man. man. That's <laughs> uh, yeah, Woodrow. Uh, the way that he experienced it, being you know a man who wants to be a plant, and like the way that it overwhelmed him, you know, and the way that it like kind of drove him like further towards you know um, psychosis, I guess, or however you want to define like the transformation that he goes through. I, I thought that. That was a, a like that juxtaposition was really useful for taking this thing that's very abstract that you could very easily kind of just give like a you know a hand wavy comic book explanation for of like this is what this is and look at it you know like get it right it, it felt like it grounded the concept in a way that made it feel more like internally consistent for me yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I already am really well versed, I guess, with the green just from the, 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 the stuff they did in the new 52. So it was cool to see, I guess, where it came from, or maybe, I don't know if this is the original showing, yeah. but okay, cool. Yeah. So it was pretty cool to see the origin of that, but, um, not groundbreaking. Marco. Yes. That issue proved that Swamp Thing is in fact a superhero. No, it doesn't, bro. Bro, Swamp Thing's 100% a superhero. He's not. He oh does my so God. much superhero shit. Just because he writes poems and grows flowers doesn't mean he's not a superhero. <laughs> That's exactly why he's not. Superman can't grow flowers. Yeah, Are you kidding me? That, bro, samurais write haiku. Like, just because you do <laughs> art doesn't mean you're not a warrior. <laughs> Speaking of having to be a warrior, he, in in uh, issue 23, he has to sort of confront um, it ends on on him confronting Woodrue, but but prior to that, there's this whole buildup of Woodrue coming into the town of Lacroix and um, uh, killing the police, the the police uh, sheriff. He sends everybody to their homes. He traps them. He accelerates the oxygen. There's just so much going on, and um, I thought that uh, I was curious to hear what you guys thought of like that whole sort of buildup, and and was there like stakes in in that small moment for you? You're talking about in 23 or in 24 when they actually in, when it comes to a head in in 23 when they when they're like uh, building up to the actual fight. Yeah, I mean, I I once I got through the door on like 21, I was in. You know, like I found the whole thing captivating. Like I really didn't feel like there was like a weak issue in the run for me personally. So like, you know, the fact that. I'm not reading this month to month. Like I was, I was like, yeah, let's fucking go. Like, let's get in the next one, man. When, when the Pharaonic man, when Woodrow loses the green because, you know, he was using it and exploiting it. It, it felt like the end of all star Superman when Luthor uh, starts losing the ability mm. to see everything, how Superman sees it. Mm. and uh there was something tragic about it but at the same time uh satisfying because it's a character who doesn't deserve it and um yeah i mean i was i was i was in the previous issue and the, the payoff was really satisfying um 
No, was, yeah, I was all in, baby. I really liked uh, the Floronic Man as a villain. Mm-hmm. I think this uh, this run, if you look at it, not for necessarily the the actual things that happen, but if you look at the template, I guess this is this is perfect. Uh, you, we just spent to what two issues an issue two issues I guess sort of rebuilding Swamp Thing and juxtaposed with that you get the Floronic Man becoming more of what he wants to become so as Swamp Thing is falling Floronic Man is rising Mm. um, and then that all comes to a head where Swamp Thing is kind of like reborn in terms of you know knowing what he has to be and what he has to do to deal with uh, this threat and to protect the green and protect earth. And it feels like you, you could have done, you could have stretched that out for several issues and it's wild how that gets dealt with. And then there's even more to deal with. And it just feels like such a perfect journey for this character. I I think that's one of the things I appreciate the most about, I don't know, like, <clears throat> this this run specifically, I think, does this really well. But I think this is a thing that you saw in a lot of comics from this time, and we've talked about that, where, like, things felt a little more episodic, where, like, they're a little bit more contained. But, like, in this run, it's, like, each mini arc, you know, feeds into a greater narrative and, like, the greater understanding of, like, who Swamp Thing is and what he's about and what he represents and what his struggle is and, like... Uh, it it hits all the right notes, I think, in terms of, like, how you do good micro and macro storytelling in, like, a monthly book, you know? And, like, that's, like, yeah. what I really appreciated about it was, like, it felt really, really uh, satisfying to read issue to issue because I often got a sense of completion. But the story was never over. It was just that beat of it had been you know, had been wrapped and like, it almost gives like, um, you know, you, you said before that the book had kind of had like a monster of the week vibe before. Whereas like this, it feels almost more like, um, like episodic and like a, like a Western kind of way, you know, of, of like, oh, all right. Like Swamp Thing's got to roll into town and deal with this thing this time. But the ultimate takeaway from it isn't necessarily the resolution of this one conflict. It's like, well, what has he learned about himself? Right. Yeah. Because sure, this issue or these two or three issues, I guess, right, are what's going on with the Floronic Man and, you know, all that those great points that Sean made about, I think, how that story ebbs and flows and why that's satisfying. But there's also the takeaway of it of, well, Swamp Thing walks away from this confrontation more comfortable with who he is. Right. He has the conversation with Abby afterwards where he's like, I'm not Alec. Alec died. I'm the Swamp Thing. I'm something else. And like, that's a big moment for him. And it comes at the conclusion of this smaller arc for another character. And, like, it just – it keeps that momentum going because all the buckets are feeding into each other so well, you know? Yeah. Um, the – yo, when he when he whips uh, Wooder's ass and he's, like, limping back to his little fucking hut, uh, he puts on the, the flexi flash. He's like, oh, I'm a human. I'm a person like you. And the Justly mm-hmm. come in. He's like, all right, bro, chill out. Yeah. I that thought kind that, of the fact that, that the whole framing device of that issue is just the Justice League are like watching like yeah. what are we gonna do and Swamp Thing just deals with it and they're like yes great awesome <laughs> it's so funny well, someone's watching these corners of the earth that we can't keep an eye on it's just such a like it's such a comic book thing of like they did this so they could put the Justice League on the cover and be like next issue the Justice League are coming and they don't do shit at all yep. <laughs> speaking of the league though I, I mean, they had no, they didn't factor much, but the way that they are introduced, I thought, I thought that uh, that first page that they're on was very, very, very good. Mm-hmm. Um, the, like the Watchtower. Yes, oh, yeah. the yeah, way that cool. they're they're draped in shadow, like you can't see really their faces. You see um, Arrow's face, but like Firestorm and Superman are kind of, and Haw- a Hawkman as well. You can't really see their faces. Green Lantern, you only see his ring. And then when he is standing in the background, he's still kind of obscured. I, I really like that. Um, 
it, it made them feel separate from everything else. It made them feel um, like God. Yeah, him. exactly. Exactly. And, and the writing contributed that to um, like Alan Moore did a really, uh, really nice job of kind of introducing this pantheon high above the earth. Mm-hmm. And, and he, re- he reduced them to like their basic concepts for, you know, Superman talks about hope and Hawkman talks about war like he's like Aries or something. Um, really effective uh, utilization of these characters that really had nothing to do with the story beyond being a framing device for the narrative. It's kind of like in Earth X when when um, uh, uh, the 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 Watcher is kind of used as like a framing device for that narrative. Mm, sure. Yeah. And and he's used here too to some extent. Um, and later on in the in the series um, i mean the monitor i mean sorry that's what i meant <laughs> damn it he was watching shit i know <laughs> dc and marvel have similar concepts oh he's the same thing he's the dc watcher i know um, i have to call you out on it no you're good please that just Listeners. lit sean up you just <laughs> see <his> beaming <laughs> um so the next, uh, the next few issues, twenty five to twenty eight, I think are some of my favorite. Uh, Wait, I'm Jason. sorry, Marco. Real quick before we move on, just yeah. I just want to talk about the last page of that issue, where oh. Swamp Thing like has accepted himself and he's just walking through the swamp with his arms oh. like stretched out. It's yeah, yeah, so yeah. great. Like <laughs> it's just, he's like it's like a almost like Christ like kind of thing, but like I I just feel like. The like slight like smile you can kind of see on his face and everything. It reminds me of um like that uh that He Man gif, you know, he's just like oh he's just drinking in the sun, you know? So like so serene. My voice one of my favorite synthesizing. Pages. <laughs> <laughs> he's getting a snack. Um so the, the the subsequent issues, um, for me, I think the larger thing was he starts to introduce you to like his biggest inspirations like he starts to introduce his love of art uh, more specifically like his his art influences he starts to introduce his writing influences and then his comic influences and in like in these uh issues subsequently so and and he does it all around the same concept of similarly like uh, a fear um with the introduction of the monkey king this demon that gets summoned oh, and that yeah. shit rules the uh, a um so abby gets a job at an autistic center she's taking care of children and one of the first children that she interacts with is or she's like sort of assigned to is a child who has experienced some trauma where uh his parents were playing with a ouija board and inadvertently summoned a a lower demon called the monkey king and Who among us whom among us we've all been there <laughs> I hate when that happens, man. You accidentally spell camera. Fuck. Great way to ruin your slumber party. <laughs> um, but I I wanted to ask you guys how uh how his for example the sleep of reason right the introduction of the sleep of reason in um the actual art piece by Goya how that sort of plays into all the sort of characters and the elements that get expressed in that specific issue, the the fear as well as the monsters. Uh, wait, what's the frame of your question? So like like the, the paint yeah the the painting, the sleep of reason. It's mm-hmm. it's uh it's named after the painting that Goya did that Jason Blood picks up in the art store. Got it. Mm, okay. And it, it opens and ends with that. Um it's larger just around like the the painting itself is around um it's a societal painting about how if you fall asleep, you know, uh, it, it produces monsters around you. You know, you, you have to be socially aware. But in this context, um, it's a little more literal than that. Falling asleep. Actually, your death. Yeah. Mm. Okay. See, I didn't know that. See, that's good. Of course, you know these things just like yeah. the back of your hand, my dude. Yeah, that's great context. <laughs> I, um, <clears throat> I, I, I didn't necessarily clock that that way before so i i appreciate that there i was looking at the issue and i'm like are you talking about the kids drawings marco no it's <laughs> it's an actual famous piece of art uh no that's good and i think i think in this issue introducing jason blood who i recognize by uh 
visual alone with the white streak of hair down his kind of uh, the crimson red. hair. Yeah. I was like, oh, oh, we're getting some medieval demon shit now. I am already. And so that that's that's oddly appropriate. Uh, obviously, Alan Moore is like very interested in Gothic literature. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had no idea that that painting was utilized that way. So I appreciate that context. Um, these two issues, uh, I think it's two, unless it's three, but three. my memory of it is it three. Okay. Yeah. These three issues uh, are exciting. Uh, the Demon Etrigan is one of my favorite kind of underutilized characters in comics. I think I think writers in general really struggle with him for obvious reasons because they have to uh, write him in kind of a rhyming style and it has to have kind of a... Um, uh, uh, it's an iambic pen- pen- pentameter. Thank you, iambic pentameter. Yeah, yeah, that's hard to do. That's really challenging, um, and and that inherently is kind of framed with this Hellboy esque style of of like kind of um, uh, like fairy lore stuff, you know. Um, I had never thought of Swamp Thing in that context before, and if I had known that, I would have. Uh, I would have read so much more Swamp Thing earlier. The the Gothic horror piece. Yeah, it was great. It was okay. awesome. There's um, the the subsequent one actually where this shirt is comes from. Um, Explain. Is it's the subsequent? Uh, it's the subsequent run. Um, but that that entire thing is all around Gothic Southern horror. What what's your shirt of for the audio? Oh, listener? this is uh episode forty four. Uh, sorry, episode. Uh, this is issue number forty four, and it's swamp thing behind an american flag that uh at the bottom of it starts to turn into like the streaks of it start to turn into blood mm. um but that's like the that's part of like one of the the, lar- the later sort of story arcs that, that he delves into how many issues but did did more go on this from 20 through to 67 okay, i want to cool. say so I got, yeah like, i got a couple more to read like four or five years nice um, yeah, so I um I thought this was I, I really love this arc and I, I think uh issue twenty five is a great example of like I think the the praise I've been you know giving more for his writing where like Swamp Thing's actually only I just counted, I think he's only on five pages in mm-hmm. this issue. Um but great. but it's it's well written and you you know, you're already at least I as a reader was already in at this point. So it's like, yeah man, like give me the breadcrumbs, where are we going? <laughs> Um, so and I think that really just speaks to his his skill. Go ahead, Phil. Marco. In, in this issue, uh, a character is impaled with a swordfish. Right. What's uh? Is that just meant to be foreshadowing doom? You think? It's meant to be foreshadowing like um, Jason Blood's like his whole thing because he tells the guy Harry K- the the I forget what the guy's name is at the beginning the salesman Harry Price like, Harry Price that that he's gonna get impaled at some point he's gonna die i know but like is that meant to foreshadow the you know stuff with the monkey king not necessarily um but it's supposed to in- inflict like fear like because at the end of that interaction he's like sweating he's, he's just scared hmm. all the characters throughout throughout this like these few issues are afraid to some extent i thought this was where the horror elements of the book really kicked in mm-hmm. this this arc was pretty freaky uh that monkey king creature (laughs) was something else and whatever the hell was going on with um with matt yo oh man Mm. that was so weird yep uh and, and and you know this does feel like i feel like there's there's an episode of buffy that that reminds me of this very much um and I think a lot of it, it does kind of feel like Monster of the Week, but it's done so well, and it has um, it does have deeper deeper implications for where the series is going. Mm. But this is this to me just felt like Alan Moore getting to flex and <laughs> yeah. giving the artists opportunities to to do their thing as well. You know, Swamp Thing is at the end of the day, a monster and he should be dealing with things like this. Yeah. And I loved this part of the book because it does give you that element as well. Yeah. It's definitely a real, like 
it's an artist book, you know, like they get to do so many cool things. And like, I feel like the contrast of the way that these issues feel versus kind of the first arc and like the exploration of the green and all that stuff, like it feels like a little bit more intimate because it's kind of like, you know, I don't know, like the, the focus is tighter. It's really only like one or two locations, uh, which is cool too. It, it gives like, it, it almost gave me like, um, like demon bear vibes, Marco. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and especially yeah. I think in the context of like uh the like the autistic school, like it being within like a centralized sort of setting. Yeah, exactly. You know what uh you know what this felt the most reminiscent of in a contemporary sense to me? Uh it felt most reminiscent to like Immortal Hulk. Dude, I was gonna say that, yeah. Oh yeah. okay. Yeah, this this whole run felt like Immortal Hulk and it wouldn't be a surprise and hopefully we get to speak to him again, but uh if if um al ewing actually had read this i I mean i would imagine he has read this yeah but i could see this creeping into the way that he was telling the story of immortal hulk because it's very similar yeah a thousand percent i was curious about what you guys felt um with the portrayal of like the some of these developmental disorders like autism how he sort of uses the the kids to sort of portray a a an ambiance of like weirdness yeah i i was gonna um bring that up at some point where like that was kind of the one thing that um uh there was like a few things actually throughout this run that i felt like dated the book in a bad way and mm-hmm. that was one of them where it's like yeah that's like a little bit you know, like, that's not exactly how, like, autism works, you know? And, like, yeah. it, it feels kind of, like, um, like reminiscent of the way that, like, horror suspense will use, like, multiple personality disorder as, like, right. a, and, like, very much, like, you know, um, I don't want to say romanticize it because that's the opposite of what they're doing. But, like, you know, uh, I guess, like, use a, a, a very real... Um, you know, mental disorder and like kind of character caricaturize it to make it seem spooky. You know, I don't think they were trying to make the mental illness seem spooky. Not necessarily, but like they, I feel like, um, particularly in the the initial like introduction of uh, of the what's the boy's name, Fred. Is, Is it Fred? Fred? Yeah. Um, of him, like there, no, there was Paul. like wait, Paul. Fred. Paul. Is it Paul? Yeah, Paul. The, little, the, the little redhead kid. That, yeah, Paul, Paul. Yeah, him. Um, the, especially the initial issue where he's introduced. I remember that kind of like I was like, eh, that feels like a little. It felt a little off mm-hmm. to me. For for a little bit of context, there's um there's a interview with cartoonist kayfabe uh, Ed Pesker Jim uh, Jim Rugg where. Stephen Bissett comes on and he actually mentions that during this, during this run, his wife was actually working at an autistic center. Um, he doesn't delve too deep into it, but um, I, I'm assuming that some of these elements were sort of taken from that in conversations with, uh, with more, but I think, I think to the, to the point on like the usage of it, uh, the, the biggest thing for me was the, the framing of because they are developmentally challenged, they, they don't believe in Paul, they don't believe his words, and that sort of right. amplifies the horror aspect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I try not to think too much about things like this because it's an old comic, and mm-hmm. there are thoughts and feelings and nuances that just were not present then. But I think Marco, that you hit on something that is important, you know you know we can lambast this portrayal all we want but i i actually think what alan was trying to get across um was the way like you just said that they don't believe him because of his mental illness right and how often things like that can and do happen uh elderly people get abused all the time and people don't believe them sometimes because of the fact that they're elderly and they may have delusions or you know, things like that, dementia that could lead to them not necessarily being aware of what is happening and what's not. And 
in that framing, I feel like this was done well. Um, and that's not even, that's not abnormal. That's, that's a pretty common thing in media. I honestly, like, I thought he was sympathetic too. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Like his parents, his parents died and uh, he's being haunted by a demon. Right. And so like at the end when he's able to um, conquer his fear and he has a conversation with Swamp Thing, a literal monster, it, it was like a really satisfying arc to this this new character. To I fear. really like that dialogue between them uh, when Swamp Thing's like walking him home, you know? Yeah. Um, I thought that was really sweet. The whole like, uh, what's the line that he says where he's like, oh, like if even monsters get scared sometimes, then I guess it's not so bad. I was like, yeah. that's, that's a, a very, very humanizing moment, I think to that um i want to talk about because uh, because the 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 issue sort of contrasts the horrors that paul and swamp thing and abigail and etrigan are going through at the same time with the internal sort of struggle that matt's having so i, I want to i want to focus in on matt on this for this part because you know he succumbs to his fear whereas paul is able to su- supersede that um no, nah, Matt's well, good, dude. He's fine. He's totally <laughs> chill. Nothing's bad happening to him. <laughs> but like, what was your perception of Matt up until this point? Well, he's by design not to be. He's you know he's antagonistic to Abby. He's not sympathetic. He you know lies. He drinks and he's doing weird shit with this kind of illusionary magic that we're that's not clear up until this point. Uh, you know, at this point, you kind of think fuck him. Oh, yeah. You know, it was the defining thing for me that was like, fuck him, was that he didn't have a job. <laughs> I was like, get a fucking Jeez. job, dude. Like, what do you Damn. do? Like, it's like, oh, I went and bought us a house. I was like, with what money, dude? You're just sitting around getting drunk all day while your wife goes to work. Like, get it together, Matt. He, there's a recession. Yo, whatever, dog. She got a job in like one day. They're living at a motel. Like, go dig a ditch somewhere. Make some money. Like, do something with your day. You son of a bitch. Damn. Savage. I'm just saying, he's like jealous of his wife going to work. He's like, oh, all you care about is these fucking kids. It's like, well, somebody's got to put food on the table. Why don't you get a job, Matt? Right. You hear you hear here first, folks. Pete doesn't think people should have unemployment or welfare. <laughs> he thinks that everyone needs to have a job. Now, if we can get away from another one of Pete's generalizations and talk about the book. <laughs> oh, um, no, okay. Uh, well, you know. Um, <laughs> I really, really was annoyed by their relationship in general. Um, I, I, it it made me dislike Abby, actually. Really? Oh, really? Yeah. Same because way. it. first of all, I, I felt like the whole love triangle angle of this story was the worst part. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Agreed. I didn't like the fact that she clearly was pining for Swamp Thing and meanwhile her husband say what you want about his who he is he was going through a nightmare clearly yeah um and she didn't care about any of that he even tried to offer her the keys during their last argument and she's just like I'll walk you know uh, which is absolutely idiotic um so their whole dynamic i just i just didn't care for i liked what was going on with matt it was compelling to to see that but then you know when he dies and her biggest thing is just like she wants to be with swamp thing that was i just thought that was awful so um for that it it kind of plays back to what i mentioned in the beginning like all that they had were these horrors in their lives that kept them together so the the question Mm. for me was in this moment do you think that matt truly wanted to like you know he gave up so easily right he he he, he, he came to the fly so easily was it because he truly loved her or was it because he was trying to stay alive was was the was the love there because they were they were the only ones for each other like it was just them two or was there actual love there um are you asking in the context of the moment or throughout the like in, in the context, res- 
I think we get resolution on that. Like at the end when he's dying himself, you know, he sacrifices it all and is willing to jeopardize the life of Arcane, who's keeping him alive as a meat bag to save Abby. He right. like he makes the effort. That's his redemption. He fails, but he tries. Right. And that was so, something that really yeah. made me dislike her even more is he's making this big sacrifice play. And when that resolves and he's dead, she's just like, oh, well, time to move on to Swampy. Well, it's, yep. it's funny because, like, I don't – does she even know that he did that? Right? Like, I, I don't think Swamp Thing told her, right? Like, I don't remember. Like, it's like – for all she knows, it's like he just dies, and then she goes and visits him in the hospital for a while, and then it's like, all right, well, I guess they, that's that. Um. Uh, Sean, that that's a that's a common critique that's lobbed at the book because I think the the relationship there and the the sort of characterization of Abby is probably the weakest. Yeah. Because um, she's sort of just always in the middle. She's always in the middle of something. She's a damsel kind of. Mm. Um, Very much. There's like no agency of her own, really. Right. Beyond what, like loving the swamp thing. Yeah. That like, was. Oh no! Go ahead. John. That was something that was hard as a person who came into these characters later on, because she is not like this in the later stuff that I've read. Mm, so to yep. see her this way was very strange. Um, and it didn't make me dislike the character overall, just here specifically, I wasn't mm. a fan. Uh, Pete, you were gonna say something? Um, I don't I don't remember the thread. It's not worth pulling on, go ahead. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, he, you know, in, in that moment, he, he gives it up for, his his being for her, but I think throughout the um, the the sympathetic part for me had always been that you know she wasn't in love with him, um, and and for even more context, they kind of get married, and because they um, they have just been going on these adventures for so long, um, so they in issue she get meets them in issue two of this uh new volume so of the volume two issue two that's where she gets introduced and throughout the rest they're all following swamp thing and his adventures um and by circumstance you know they've been together for so long and they're like oh we should build a future together and and they sort of um get married and fall in love that way so um i think i think in the context of this series it sort of feels like not enough but um, for not enough for Abby to just kind of say like, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm no longer in love with you. But in in like a, a larger sense, um, I think there's there's a little bit of leeway that can be given to her. But I, you know, your the point's taken. It's valid. Yeah, I guess uh, to build on Sean's point, like I, I never really got the impression that she like was ever in love with him. You know, like from by, by the time that we're introduced to them as characters, like my point of entry, it, it feels like their marriage is already kind of fizzling. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know? Yep. That is addressed. I, I think, I think that's, that's made pretty clear. My issue is just like, okay, you're married to a dude. Clearly you're, you're, you're crushing on some other dude. <laughs> and by the end of it, it felt like, well, was she just waiting for him to die or something like awful to happen? So she could hook up with the next guy. It was just like, mm, I don't know. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. Like, I didn't necessarily, like, think of it that way at the time. But I think, like, when you lay it out like that, like, you just think of the beats of the story. Like, you're totally right, you know, especially with the hospital thing where it's like she's there and it, like, seems like she's upset that he's in the hospital. And then it's like, nah, you really just want to go be with something. And I was like, oh, it's kind of fucked up. Like, he's still alive. Yeah. yeah that was crazy. Uh, it's... <laughs> I was gonna tie it into uh, kind of a real world fucked up example, but uh, when when Casey Anthony was in a vegetative state, everyone found out that her husband was like having an affair, and everyone's like, "Ooh, dude, bad, bad, bad look." Yeah, terrible look. Um, but you know what? From a completely self serving standpoint, it ended up being really worth it for Abby. If you know what I'm saying, that shit was trippy. <laughs> uh, she got that tater, I guess. Accept, acceptable know. loss threshold you know yeah oh i don't like that expression ever. <laughs> so b before we move on to i think my my favorite arc uh love and death it, i just wanted to call out what i, I thought was uh, really interesting for 
the issues overall, like 25, 26, and 27, where uh, Sleep of Reason was an art piece um, centered around this painting by Goya. The selection from Night of the Hunters, which emphasizes the fear and sets up the issue in issue number 26. Like that's from um, an old an old movie. It's probably like- Yeah, that's a great movie. Yeah. Night of the Hunters, uh, that uh, famous love hate tattoos. It's a, it's, a, it's a Christian man trying to avenge uh, another man who's dead. And because he's dead, he's going after his children. Um, that's a, oh, that's a classic film. That's excellent. And the last issue he actually dedicates to, um, to Jack Kirby. And, and right. that's like his dedication to like the love of comics, right? His, his three influences, which in, in this case for me was, you know, the, the art piece of it, the, um, the film aspect, which is, you know, the pacing, the, the camera direction, the way to sort of build the, the story and then comics as like a, a medium and like the love for that. He's been very outspoken about his love for Jack Kirby and in doing so will shit all over Stan Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, my favorite thing about <clears throat> um, about these issues was definitely the art. And, like, there's so much really cool, creative paneling. Yeah. Um, that really, like, it just, it just makes the thing feel more dynamic. Because it is, like, this, like, smaller, a little bit, like, I don't want to say quiet, but it feels like a more intimate story, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like the, like, the way that the paneling's done and the way that like background color is used, like to give moments like that, um, that higher contrast is yeah is really cool. Like it, it it really guides your eye like in a you know through even these unique kind of layouts in a way that feels super super fluid. This is my like comics. It, it, it's funny because this is my like comics one hundred and one in that this is the first thing I ever read. So like. This is you. This set the no, bar. No, no, no that, that, it's like Swamp Thing. The, this mm. arc set the bar for like, oh, I didn't know all comics were like this. Spoiler alert, right. they're not. Yeah. Um, what are you reading right now, Onslaught? <laughs> yo, that's another book club. Um, nope. Uh, so 29 is by far my favorite, uh, one of my favorite issues. I think like second favorite only to the the second annual, but it opens on this it opens on abby literally scrubbing herself so hard that she passes out from the pain um this issue of swamp thing was the first one to go around the comics code authority ah. specifically specifically because it um it included sex zombies incest as well as potential rape um uh so for context not potential well, so, not potential. so it's like a later alan moore comic basically <laughs> yes basically <laughs> he he introduces three surprises that matt has like the the, the build-up to this is that matt matt has sort of turned around ever since the fly has kind of gotten in, into him that's obviously context that we have that abby doesn't um and they're made up of three things a house a job which apparently all America needs. All America needs. Um, <laughs> all humans. Otherwise, all humans, you're a piece yeah. of shit. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the reveal that Arcane has was actually the fly and had take has taken over Matt. So, I want to start with the context of what did you guys feel um, when you read this issue? Like, what was the reveal? How did that? How did you guys sort of did that hit you? And how did it hit you? Dude, I was freaked out <laughs> when I saw those those people and she saw them as dead. Yeah. But they weren't or, you know, whatever. Like, that was so weird. The woman up front who's just straight drooling. Oh, oh my God. Oh, oh awful. Um, yeah. The horror that we talked about earlier, I felt like with this issue just got ratcheted up to another level yep. and it was just so creepy when she reads about um sally parks and just all these panels with bugs crawling all over the place and everything else was just really disturbing as we build towards uh the return of anton arcane and 
this revelation about what is really going on with Matt, the culmination of that being that, that, that splash page, the double page splash. Yep. Oh, oh my God. And it's like, I saw it coming that he was Anton, but then Did you really, to, yeah. Um, but then for him to, to, to say it and then for it to be this page, Oh man, Jesus. Yeah, this this issue definitely like sent a, a chill up my spine, you know. It was terrifying. Like there, there's one page where she's like trying to like destroy her clothing, and it's all framed with insects. Yeah, and it, it looks like they're like photos. Um, it was it was plague like. Uh, the visuals, some of the visuals remind me of. Uh, scenes in the green mile where like bugs come out of people's mouths if you remember that movie oh yeah yeah um and then it, it, it really just really lent itself in a lot of classic horror stuff like the zombies themselves look like they were from like uh night of the living dead mm-hmm. like cl- a classic ass zombie look um and just like like particularly with abby like the way it opens up with her doubled over like in fucking agony like that set the tone like i i was talking to someone when i was reading it and i opened a fucking page and it's like i gotta shut up now and look at <laughs> look what's happening <laughs> yeah that i think that's one of the most striking visuals in the issue um like that you know just like this mass of like death you know, in like the lower half of her body, yeah, like the yep. look on her face, like she's got that like thousand mile stare. It's really, really unsettling. The I think the what the crazy part is is that you know this was as much as it was like a physical horror for her. I think it was the mental anguish because she gets lured into this sense of security with the house, with the job. You know, the 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 two biggest things that you need to sort of. Uh, like live live your life you need to be able to to pay for your home as well as pay for your life and then the reveal that all along this fake happiness that she was starting to experience just wasn't real and if anything was uh done so with malice Mm. uh, fucked my shit up well yeah yeah and i mean obviously like the the sexual assault angle of it like and i i think that like it's it's pretty subtle, I think, the way that he has her, like, come to the realization and then, like, feel that disgust and, like, how that is playing a role in, like, the overall, you know, um, like, breakdown moment here for her. Um, mm-hmm. I think the fact that it was handled that way um, was, like, a, a you know, a, an example of, like, I don't know, like, I, I liked that it, it, it didn't feel like... Um, it didn't feel like it was like uh shock value yeah yes yes that's the perfect way yeah. to put it yeah um it, it, it was subtle and i think that that like added a you know a, a, just another layer of just you know like really just having this whole issue like fill you with disgust you know and like make your skin crawl and make you recoil you know mm-hmm. and the the art definitely plays into that um i think was is probably the strongest in, in this issue like uh sean mentioned like the bugs all around yeah um the panels i don't know if you noticed but every time that she's not having a memory the panels are all uh or anytime that something's like sort of amiss the panels are either slightly skewed they're um like in for example in in, in this page one is kind of just like it could be clean but this one is kind of just like up a little bit like that's a little weird yeah Um, and there's just subtle moments like that throughout the entire issue where there's not even panels, things are slanted, the colors are fucking wild. Just like the distortions of of like her face too. Yep. You know, like um, it's one of the last pages of the issue where there's like a a panel where it's like her screaming, and then like it blends into Swamp Thing's arm, you know, like reaching down for this dead bird. Oh yeah, and just like like little things like that that are like play into that very very simple rule of human psychology, right? Where like you take something familiar and like tweak it a little bit, and how much that makes you uncomfortable. 
That's what I wanted to bring up. I really like the way this kind of story is framed uh, for Swamp Thing. It's it's framed by seeing what appears to be a dead bird writhing around on the ground, mm-hmm. sharp as he describes it. And the only reason it's writhing on the ground is because it's filled with bugs. Like what a what a what a like way to set up the story for Swamp Thing. Like that's his entrance into this narrative, right? Yeah, and, and very, very gothic. <laughs> like, similarly, he's not in the issue too much, except for, like, some flashbacks here or there. But um, the way Moore is able to to navigate around with other characters and still inject this horror element into it is, like, top tier for my in my book. Um, well, this is your book, so. This is my book, so. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the next, the next uh, two issues is... Um, you know, he has, uh, Arcane has Abby trapped. She, they, they, she now realizes who he is, um, and he sends out this wave of madness, first starting locally, then continues to spread using Cable's, uh, Matt Cable's powers. And I think the my favorite part was he kept saying, like, the returned man. Mm. Um, again, back to, like, the motifs that he uses, like, the... Oh. I, th- I thought it was really striking to to hit the point that this was um, that this was like a truly evil thing. Oh yeah, this is sinister, like utterly sinister. This man, Arcane, he uh, embodies like the worst qualities of of a person, and, and one of the worst and the, one of the greatest qualities of a person is life itself, and he represents like the antithesis of life by being uh, undead, basically. And this gets explored like in other series where he becomes the avatar of uh, the black, like actual yeah, death. Death. Um, I think I, I think the the you know it, it just kind of reveals how he did it. He was able to escape from the the confines of hell. He was. It turns out that he was the one who influenced you know the 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 demon, the monkey king coming out. He was the one who influenced. Um, a lot of what had been happening, the the accident with Matt, like all these details, um, he had been toying with everything so that he could put the pieces for his return. Um, did you, you know? How did you guys like that? The culmination. I, I thought it was really well done. Uh, I really, I mean, first of all, you know, we keep mentioning how horrific this was, man. There's so many just disgusting pages um one of the things that i noticed was that teeth were bared a lot and Mm, that's not typical uh there's one panel where you can see arcane from his face from a side angle and he has these like really fucking you know (laughs) monstrous teeth um and I, i it's a small thing but i really appreciated it uh the thing that i enjoyed the most though is something that wouldn't typically be done, but it ties the entire narrative together, is that uh, Swamp Thing, he beats Anton pretty easily. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's, it's not really that much of a contest. And the reason is because he's evolved since the last time that they fought. Mm-hmm. Right. And it, it brings the entire journey that we've been on with his character full circle where he's literally not the same person that mm-hmm. Arcane had been dealing with. So because of that, he's not equipped for this fight. He doesn't know what to expect. And so he gets dealt with. Not just um, that, but the whole time he's calling him Alec, he's calling him Holland. And he's like, I'm, that's not me. Yep. You dealt with a different person before you dealt with a person before. Yeah. yeah. That was jarring while I was reading it because in my mind, well, this is his biggest foe, you know, here now 40 years after the fact, uh, that's how I'm thinking. And I'm thinking, well, they have to have this big epic, you know, final final confrontation and it doesn't happen that way. Uh, But I think that was better for the story overall. And because again, Alan Moore's run doesn't end here. So for all I know, maybe he comes back. But for this part of the story, I think yeah. that was the perfect way to handle his return. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you're yeah. gonna have him, if you're gonna have a drag him out, it needs to feel final, at least for a run. And you're right, he he could come back in this run. Um, 
this feels like a first encounter conflict. You know what I mean? Uh, I I didn't get first encounter, especially not when the the run begins with you know him defeated and, and busted. I I mean first encounter for this particular story. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is Alan Moore's run. I think it was just important to show that Swamp Thing had grown beyond what we knew him to be. In the beginning of the run, clearly he just went through this big battle. It was probably epic. And here it wasn't big and it wasn't epic. He just handled him. You know, yeah. uh, that shows the growth. I think that's one of the best pages in the book, too, um, because it, it's similar to um, was it Sutherland, right? Was the. The the business guy in the beginning that he deals with yes Sunderland Sunderland it reminded me of that where like um it, it's you know Swamp Thing is like the like his manner of speech and everything and just like the way he carries himself like he has this aura that's like very calming you know like he feels like he's like um you know very like at peace you know in in a lot of ways at least and I I feel like that that kind of turn between like the, the page of him, you know, he's saying like, don't be ridiculous Holland. What are you talking about? And that's that, that moment that Sean talks about where he's like, I'm not Holland. I'm something else. And he says, I'm in my place of power and it's a side shot. And you can see like the panels are like kind of, you know, uh, turning like as it, and then you get that full of him and he's screaming. And instead of the orange, it's red, you know? And, and he's like, and you should not have come here. And like that is such a turn for him, you know, and and those moments where, you know, he's shown to be like truly monstrous like that, it like it's intimidating, and that's really cool, you know, because it's this character who like we're rooting for, who you know we at this point like I, I feel like I'm I'm getting familiar with, and like when he does those things and they surprise me and genuinely surprise me it's like it's very it's exciting you know uh that's a good point that you bring up um especially around like how he can express his like monstrosity um because it it, it's it it feels like typically he like restrains himself he tries to he tries to to revert to being you know as quote-unquote human as possible in, in 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 his typical life but the moments where he has to like lean into what he truly is is um, to what you said. It's, it's exciting. I, I that's a good call out. Um, so next up is my favorite issue in the entire arc that we read. Bro, this is all right, how many? I forgot how many times we've played like a trivia thing. But anytime I did it, I'd had a question or something. This was always the answer. This is my favorite issue, of Swamp Thing uh the Mine annual too. number two it mm -hmm. is it is the culmination of everything that has happened so far from a story perspective from his art perspective um uh the it's an allegory for dante's divine comedy he explores heaven he explores purgatory and then he dives into the depths of hell for a soul and um it's also like where he introduces all these other supernatural characters. Yo, tell me about this issue. Like, what did you guys like about it? I mean, it it ruled stem to stern. You know, like I I feel like there's so much to choose. Like it's it's the longest issue. Um, obviously, annuals are are usually a lot more robust. But like, I remember like I couldn't put this down. You know, like it because it was it's just so engaging. Like on an artistic level, you know, I think. Overall, this book has really, really definitely been, like we said, it's an artist book. But um, there's so many cool moments going through all the different locales and, like, getting to see all these different, um, you know, manners of beast and demon and whatever. But uh, <laughs> my, literally my favorite page out of this entire run was in this issue because I, just, I thought it was so genuinely funny where um, there's the uh, – uh, it's Sunderland again, and like he's like a demon slave or whatever, yeah. and Swamp Thing like you know watches him get his tongue pulled out, and there's just this shot of Swamp Thing, and he puts his hands over his mouth. He's like, <gasps> and it, it's it, it's like the most human thing that I've seen him do in the entire run. 
And it just, I don't know why, but it really just struck a chord with me. It's so funny. My absolute favorite page, if we're talking about that, from this run also comes from this issue. And it's simply the, the full page uh, spread of the Spectre. Hell yeah. That was yes. crazy. Yes, dude. And so I had a genuine, a genuine smile, genuine reaction. This was just such a pleasure to look at. Yeah. Um, if you're you on know, YouTube, I'm, I'm holding it up. Dude, this I... is that Jack Kirby. This is like, this is, yeah. oh man, this is everything. I was like, yo, can I like, can I get this as a print? I want this on my wall. <laughs> yeah, right. It, it's gorgeous. It, it really, it really, it, I love abstract concepts in comics yep. so much. And something about DCs particularly feel really Silver Age. Uh, you have Spectre, who um, is the second uh, the second he he like the second protagonist character that uh Siegel and Schuster created back in like 1940. Yep, um, it was like a superhero kind of thing, like he was beating up bad guys in the streets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 really he's the judgment of God. Mm-hmm. Uh and I really like that kind of archa- uh, archaic biblical quality of his. Um, you know, the Phantom Stranger who is just kind of observer of, of the afterlife. Like he has no real backstory. Uh, whenever he shows up in stories, you know, things are going to get real metaphysical. Um, yeah. Boss and brand. Who's a great kind of narrative uh, is a great kind of plot device for these things. It, it, it checked all my boxes for me. <laughs> like I was like, okay, here we go. And, and all these characters are kind of vehicles for Swamp Thing to like, kind of tore the things that have happened to him because a lot of characters have died so far including alec the main character yes um i i I wanted to to hear what you guys thought about like his confront not his confrontation but like his meeting and how he i think the most striking thing for me was that he didn't want to meet linda yeah yeah that was very very it was another moment that really like like hit hit talked about my heartstrings there for him you know where like he has that degree of separation between him and alec where like i think he is learning to accept that he's the swamp thing but um he still has that in him that's still a part of of his consciousness and who he is right so like even if he isn't alec those feelings that he has are real Mm -hmm. and that's that's hard for him to navigate i'm sure you know that was so sad. That was so so sad. Uh, seeing them meet, and especially after everything that Swamp Thing went through to accept what he's not, yeah. for them to be there together, for 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 Alec to be there, uh, the idea that he was actually trapped until Swamp Thing buried him properly. Mm-mm. Man. <laughs> We didn't even talk about that issue. Twenty eight. That was one of my favorites. The one of him finding the bones and and, and the and, burial. Yeah, that was yeah. very very beautiful. So that one was interesting enough. Uh, there's an there's an interview, but that was actually a filler issue that he wrote because they were working. I, f- I forget if they were working on this annual or if they were working on uh, issue thirty. But um, that's why they had to switch an artist. I for think Sean it's, McManus. I think it's thirty because I went and looked up why you were having a skip 33 or 32 32? yeah that was when we skipped uh i looked that up and that 32 and 33 were both filler issues as well yeah yeah oh. different different creative teams oh i love 33 yeah well 33 was the original team it was bernie and and len yeah, right? that's and, right yeah and and that one i want to get i want to get to to the to the end yeah, um, yeah for sure you know um but but um but yeah like i think one of the most interesting interactions for me was phantom uh, the phantom stranger discussing you know the existence of existence and like what is can can you be yeah. and can you enter into into paradise um like what is uh good and evil itself the swamp thing have a soul yes the swamp thing have a soul but if he can travel to the depths of hell is he corporeal, even though he's just a consciousness? Like, there's so much that gets explored. Um, 
and actually uh the so the the, the subsequent run where the shirt is from uh, issue 34 that I have, like that actually culminates in a larger discussion focused specifically on this discussion between uh, good and evil. What is justice um, that uh, we didn't cover on this run, but I, I urge everybody to go read after this because it's an incredible, incredible run. Um, and so he continues down into the depths of hell and he finds Etrigan, you know, the, who has been deemed a rhyming demon uh, this is actually where he became, like, quote unquote, has been ascended in hell. Previously, he'd, he'd rhyme here or there, but this is the first time he's actually, like, established a hierarchy in hell. Mm-hmm. And, That's Dante. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and and the, the, subtle, the, the subtle thing that he, he says to the stranger, he's like, as they're approaching, it's getting colder, which is obviously an allusion back to Dante's Inferno as well. Right. Um, I loved um, I loved how the stranger was like, oh, like you can't go with him. Like, what about the rules? And he's like, what are they gonna do? Send me to hell? Yeah, <laughs> I was like, he's got, he's got such a a great attitude. <laughs> he's badass. Um, yeah, I, I I thought he was a really really appealing character, especially as like a, a companion for Swamp Thing because Swamp Thing is such a a straight man. Like yes. having someone who's like a little bit more charismatic, um, I thought played well. They find Arcane again. How did you guys feel about that? That was one of my favorite pages where uh, where he's just like, oh, tell me like how many years have I been here? And he's like, since yesterday. I was just like, yes. Like, fuck you, dude. <laughs> Talk so about a burial. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I liked it. Uh, <laughs> I, I kind of... You know, I don't know. Like, I just made the joke about him getting buried. Uh, of course, a wrestling term for when someone is just kind of treated poorly. Uh, and I feel like it did diminish the character just a little bit. Um, and now I was feeling like, oh, this dude's just a joke. Like, mm. he's just trash. Um, cause he got beaten clean. He got beaten really easily. <laughs> and then now he's here just biting biting swamp things leg or whatever like he's just he's just trash he got his head kicked off <laughs> it, it, no it, respect. For, for me it like it emphasized that he like, like to your point he is just he is trash he's like a garbage human yeah but he's also supposed to be extremely powerful right so like, yeah compared well, to was, alec but not compared to swamp thing true <laughs> well <laughs> um but i think it, it it ends with uh them finding abby in exchange for a flower i think that was very poetic a flower for a flower where um phantom stranger you know at the beginning of the issue picks a flower off the hills of heaven and gives it to etrigan as as the, the the exchange um and he's back uh, she's back rather and then we get into sexy times. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> well, the the issue after that's the the the, the love issue. The um. Oh you yeah, s- no, you're right. Okay. You skip the fucking Cain and Abel stuff, but it's fine. Well, I, I mean, so for for that, I wanted to to specifically ask, like, from a continuity perspective, um, where they Abby has a dream. She visits the realm of the House of Mystery and the House of Secrets, which were part of the EC um, comics line that got taken into DC. And Hill House. Um, yes, the, the Hill House stuff, especially now. So they actually. Oh, I didn't, re- I didn't pick up on that. That's really cool. So previously, they were like two independent things, they weren't connected. But in this, it actually um, gets connected as like Cain and Abel. They are the, you know, the, the first story. They are the gatekeepers of stories and actually it gets recycled in um neil gaiman's sandman run where these characters are they're in the realm of uh of dream and they that's where they live and that's where their like sort of stories take place and matt cable is actually matt the raven that is um uh sandman sort of like familiar Mm. Hmm. but you know in this issue they go back to the original story so house um house secrets 92 Hmm. and it's a reprint of that story 
I wanted to know how you guys thought that it lived up to where Alan Moore had taken the character as well as um, how you felt it connects the continuity. Good. I didn't like this issue. Really? Uh, yeah. I, I didn't care about it. Um, all it, the only thing it does is establish the fact that he's not the original swamp thing, that this is a thing that's been going on, but everything other than that was just whatever I thought. Yeah, I I generally agree with you. Like, I, I thought it was um, more interesting for the information that I took away from it than it was as an issue in and of itself. You know, like, I I know, um, I don't remember which issue it is, but there's an earlier issue where he comes in contact with the other Swamp Thing. Like, they meet and, like, they're, they touch. Oh, 28. Okay, yeah, so, like... I would thought it was cool to like come back to that and like address that and like contextualize the mythos for me as a, as a reader who did have that question because like I I didn't know all those details like I kind of casually knew that there was an Alex versus Alec and and those sorts of things just again from like osmosis through Marco but um I I like that this issue existed to sort those things out in my mind but I'm kind of with Sean in terms of my enjoyment of it as an actual issue was like lesser than probably every other one in the run by, by quite a bit. I love this issue, Marco. Some nice I shit. I can't stress that enough. To me, this issue, the surface details of it being, you know, uh, an info dump about the history of Swamp Thing is honestly the, I didn't even think of it that way. To me, what this felt like this issue was about was it's not just a cycle of Swamp Thing. It's like a it's a cycle of this reincarnation of this love triangle. Yeah. Damien is uh, Matt. Uh, Alex is obviously Alec, and um, and Linda. Uh, Miss no, Linda, Linda is. Yeah, I, I I took her to be um, uh, uh, Abby. Even, Even the cover Linda's... alludes to that any too, right? Yeah, and so it feels like it's like in in Hawkman comics where where Hawkman and Hawk Girl are reincarnated lovers through eternity. Uh, that is what it felt like here, and and it, in in the context of Cain and Abel, the first story in the Bible, uh, I so it made it seem like mythic. And it reflected in Len's prose. I really, really enjoyed this issue. I think that was why I didn't like it because it, it 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 repeated the worst part of the story, which was that's the love fair. triangle. So, yeah, yeah, that's fair. It um yeah, I think for me it was the it was my introduction to Bernie Wrightson as an artist. Um and and this actually spun out into because at the time I didn't realize that there was like a previous series and that this kind of stuff was a little more cyclical for, for comics. So it, it encouraged me to go back to read that Lynn Wien and Brendan Wrights and stuff, um, which I would definitely recommend to anybody who's interested in that. It's much, um, it's a much different flavor, but I think it's of its time. And I think it's a good example of a good comic of its time. Still got that good flowery prose, I guess. <laughs> oh, well, every issue, bro. Every issue, and then that writes in art all the way up to issue ten. Oh, I can fuck with that. Um, but the to, to close out this arc, we have the. Uh, I guess the. What is the word when you like, not marry, fuck. What do you mean? You like. Not officiate the consummation yes that it is the consummation oh. of of uh the love between alan alec and um abby and it's obviously done so through this like really trippy sort of way um my initial reading of it was this was a lot um obviously i've come back to it a couple times and I, I, I enjoy it much more, but upon first reading it, this was like too much for me to sort of handle. I don't know how you guys felt about it uh, on the onset. 
I think I felt both of those feelings. <clears throat> like I, I remember, <laughs> remember when it first started, like uh, the the first full page of of her tripping, where it's like on its side and it rotates, and I was like, "This is fucking amazing." I was like, "That is such a cool device." And then I was like, "Oh, cool! There's like more of it." And then about five pages, and I was like, "Whoa, I'm getting tired." Like, <laughs> you know, like. And it wasn't that it was bad. It was just like it's it's a lot to drink in, you know. Yeah. And, and I, I I think it's the kind of thing that benefits from a reread, you know, or a, a revisit of it uh, to be able to digest what's happening a little bit more. Because it's not only this really crazy heady art; it's like this dense, you know, narration prose about the, you know, how they consume each other and then they're tasting honey and death and it's you know like it's so flowery and romantic and i'm here for it but it's like it's a lot to take in yeah i i think i felt the same way especially after the intensity of everything that we'd read i was i was ready to just like you know be done and then there was this massive thing um, and I appreciated it for what it was, but I think uh, my my thought process is always: if you're going to do something crazy like that, let the art do the heavy lifting, and that's mm-hmm. not exactly what happens. So because of that, it, it, its its power was was lessened because there was just so much to read, and not enough opportunity to just appreciate what the artists were doing. Um, yeah, that's how I, I, I skimmed some of the dialogue to be honest. Like I just, it was just too much for me. Yeah. I, I, I think especially some of it is not useful. Like I don't, I don't think it needed to have no dialogue, but if it had half as much, it would be a lot better. Cause like I'm looking at it right now and there's like the one uh, it's one of the last, Maybe it's like the third to last one. And um, there's the shot of like them kind of fused, right? And it's like Swamp Thing, but it looks like Abby's body. And then like her hair is the strands that are connecting to every – and the like, roots. And it's like it's clear what that's trying to evoke. But there's a caption that says, we are one creature. And it's like, I don't – I didn't need that. You know, like I think it's a mix of – some of the prose and poetry and imagery of it like works, but there's just so much of it that I think it's hard to enjoy what it's doing, you know? Yeah. I, I, I mean, frankly, I think that the, the uh, overuse of narration is a little bit of a problem throughout the run itself. There's several times where things are explained that are just on the page that the artists are doing. Uh, but that's also a that is a a device of a of an older time, and of course we're seeing it now with uh, Al Ewing's uh, Empire. But you know, um, it's it's more acceptable in this kind of story. Um, yeah, you know, when she ate that potato, it was gross. <laughs> I dude, I thought it was so funny how he like went and wa- like washed it off, quote unquote, in the swamp. I was like, if anything, that made it worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it definitely. Um, I I don't know how I feel about the um, the, the prose of it. I, I think of pieces like this. Where he, he writes, a smear of platinum scales breaks the surface, rolling, resubmerging. There is a delicious ambiguity. Looking up through his eyes, the pale woman gazes down. A burning waterfall adrift on the milk waterfall of her hair. Its lank tips draw clear sable brushstrokes between the the lichens engraving my chest. I read that and I think, I don't know what to make of this. Uh, (laughs) It doesn't doesn't make me feel any clarity. But in addition, I I, I understand I'm reading this and and it feels like fifth dimensional thinking where i'm not necessarily supposed to know what i'm reading but um that's a good point yeah i i I think this is something that made sense to alan moore and probably his entire art team uh but it's lost to the reader um yeah so I, i personally i don't know how to 
I don't know how I feel about the writing here. I don't dislike it. I, I feel like I don't understand it. And I, I think that's okay in this I context. For me, because it ended the arc and the arc was so clear in its direction and because of the way that, you know, everything like led up to a, like a specific moment and then this ends it where, to your point, I mean, I was definitely confused about it. Like I, I, I also didn't know what to make of it. And, you know, to a certain extent, like still don't really outside of the fact that it's meant to be um, symb- a symbolic way for Abby and Swamp Thing to show that they're in love versus just saying it you know like physically connect right yeah and like i i dig that i think the placement of it is a problem you know because i think yeah like this is technically the end of this story you know it's it's and like i know like it says it's chapter eight right like it, it is like the resolution of a lot of threads that have been built over the beginning of this arc but like I feel like the annuals where it really ends, Mm -hmm. you know, like I I remember reading that and feeling like a sense of completion and then you have two filler issues and then you have this issue, which like is the end, but it really feels more like it's the start of something new. And I think if I had read this and then started reading the next arc right away, rather than read this and stop to do this book club, like maybe I'd feel a little bit differently about it, but it does feel like it feels like an epilogue, I guess, more than an ending. Which isn't inherently bad, but I think, to Sean's point, like, I guess you kind of feel the need for a quieter issue at this point, you know, like, with everything that's going on. And I think, like, normally characters, like, expressing their feelings and, like, you know, exploring, you know, love or whatever is, like, a, a way to do that sometimes of, like, cool, like, let's get away from the crazy metaphysical punching and focus on something that's human right now and obviously this isn't that it's just more of that stuff and that stuff's good but you know i I think uh at this point you're kind of you're ready for a breath no i don't i don't think that's the point though i i I, at the outset i said this all feels like a fever dream and that paramounts here and 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 this 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 has this has the intensity of, of being fully submerged in a swamp of, of something that's, that's beyond the intensity of like a, a long and old love. This is like the intensity, uh, burning brightness of like a, a neutron star that could burn out. I'm sure it doesn't, but like that has that intensity, that newness of something and it's, and it's manifested in, in such a, like it's like a fee it really is like a fever dream like you're it feels like something you would have while hallucinating and it is very psychedelic yeah it's electric um, you're not i don't think you're meant to breathe here because this you know to that point in and in, in the like i think that was the intention i think the execution sort of comes off a little bit different you know the, the title yeah. of this is the right of spring so I think I think that is exactly what what the what Alan Moore wanted to get across was that you know the birth of something new coming like the the spring brings up new a new life it brings up new energies you know it, it's a renewal for the earth as much as it is a renewal for everything that's happened up until this point um, I think it just it gets to your point it gets uh, it goes to that fifth dimension and it's in a way that is supposed to be beyond our perception. And I don't know that that's a great way to end, like to punctuate something. Yeah, I think, I think it works in the way that it is them doing what they wanted to do. It's executed fine. You know, like it's technically good in the sense that what they're presenting looks good you know, what Alan Moore has written is good. It's all good. It just doesn't land the way that I think they intended in spite of the fact that the work is excellent and that can happen. And I I think that's fine. Yeah. Um, Before we go to the art, is there anything that you guys wanted to like, just return to really quick about like any of the story points? Or anything cool that you just wanted to be like, yo, that's dope? 
as you know, the book. No, I feel like we did a really good job of actually going issue by issue and getting to like let each one have their moment. Um, and I think every issue does have its moment. Yeah. So I think that would be the thing I would call out is that um, I think this is a this is a real example of like a good monthly run done right. Like every issue is satisfying to some degree and the whole of it is is satisfying in multiple ways you know i think as a as a piece of horror as you know a a thing that has things to say about life and death and humanity and the nature of hearts and souls and all that like it's there's a lot here to chew on and i think all of it gets the enough room to breathe and and actually feel meaningful you know, like we're laying threads to say things, to make you feel things, not to um, just tell, right? It's all show. And that's just Alan Moore, man. He's one of the greats for a reason. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's dive right into the art then. Like uh, this is probably um, – so Stephen Bissett, John Tottlebin, Tatjana Woods, and John Costanza make up the art team. John Costanza being letters, uh, Tatiana being the the colors, but um, Stephen Bassett, John Tattleman are actually the f- they were in the first class for the um, the Joe Kubert School. They were oh. in that very first class coming out of um, that school, so they like had classes with him. They you know they uh, studied under the those original creators that were first teaching, and um, as did Rick Beach who comes in a little bit later um, and Tom Yates, who started the book. That's how they sort of got the the job. But um, yeah, uh, Phil, I think you've been pretty expressive about the art. What is, um, how did you enjoy it? And like it's progression as well, because it's sort of different from the start to the end. Yeah. In the beginning, we see panels outlined with birds I, and I, I knew right from the beginning I was going to have, um, I was going to really enjoy the art. Um, and then as we start going, you know, we, we talked about the issue with, um, with Abby, you know, uh, the, the terrible things that happened to Abby and, and how those are all, I, I think the thing that I'm most impressed by is what I'm getting at is the paneling throughout here, you know? It's it's really innovative. In fact, that very first page you talked about how you struggled to read it because it's 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 two pages worth. We we, we don't see comics panel like this very often, and it's really it's really nice. You know, we've been talking a lot about um, uh, strange adventures recently, and and the paneling there is not particularly innovative, and that's not necessarily a knock. But when we see things that are happening in, in, in a book like this, it, it shows you just how uh, meaningful the framing of the story can be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as for the art itself, characters are so often kind of cast in shadow. Uh, and, and sometimes they look off model like they do with the Justice League characters, but there's like a charm to that. Um, and sometimes we get like really unpleasant close-ups of characters that aren't in shadow, like the the, the the redheaded boy. There's an issue when you're really exposed to him. It's a giant circle panel in the middle of the page, and it's a close-up of his intense green eyes and red hair. Um, in fact, I think part of why a lot of the book feels so creepy is because it, it really fixates on these things. Um, which is something that also reminds me of Immortal Hulk because there's a lot of that type of that aspect of the art uh, is present in that book, not necessarily the paneling. Um, and then it just all paramount. It, it, it just all uh, it leads to the 34th issue, and it's a it's a tour de force artistically. Um, it, it, that reminds me of 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 the psychedelic issue of Animal Man, um, where. It, the art does, uh, I mean, this book made, helped make Alan Moore really famous, but, you know, like an animal man, like the art is equally important. Yeah. I, I can't say enough about how good the art is in this issue. 
uh, and you you talk about the paneling. I mean, that first uh, that first page there, the the, the spread. Um, if you look at what's happening on that page, this is this is what comics can do that you know no other medium can do. The way that each page is showing a different moment in time, mm -hmm. and it it's allowing you to fill in the space of the movements that take place between panels and it's never jarring. That is a fantastic way to bring, to introduce the story because it starts off really easy. Like Marco said that he, you know, had struggled to read this. And I understand that as a, as a completely new reader to comics and someone who came from manga, but um, this is very well done. This is, this is a, an example of of comics of how tremendous you know this medium can be then i want to also point out in this same issue uh you go over to the page where the bottle is tipped over and the contents of the bottle are dripping onto the next panel mm. giving yes. that panel simulating that panel as a table yeah um, that's also very very cool yeah on the next page it's the same effect. And then if you look at the, the, the panel below that, when would you ever frame a house like that? You know, when would you ever, sh when would you ever have an establishing shot of a house on its side, you know, at an angle, it's supposed to take you, it's supposed to put you off because this is off. Um, and it's a very small thing, but when you're talking about how, artists can impact a story these are the ways that they're helping bring us in as much as or more than alan moore is doing the job it's tremendous That's the first thing you see yeah i feel like you could take maybe not every single issue of this book but i think there are a few issues of this of this series that you can take and really learn from if storytelling is what you want to do and if not, learn from them for that reason, just to be able to appreciate comics more, to be able to find these things in the books. It's crazy how much of that type of stuff is here. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, to take it back to something that Phil said, I think um, the, the two things that definitely stood out, stood out to me the most were the paneling, the way that the text would play with the art, and also how it would make good use of like what your expectation of something is and, and making small modifications to that to elicit emotion, right? Like the point that Sean made about like showing the house on an angle, right? And like how that visually communicates something to you that doesn't need to be said, right? Like that is very, very creative. And, and I think it's particularly, it's particularly noticeable with it, their use of, of faces and Phil made the point of things going off model sometimes. And that's generally done to effect, right? Like yeah. it's, it's, yeah, to, yeah. it's to make you like, oh, you know how Abby's supposed to look. So when she doesn't look that way, it communicates something to you about how she feels or it makes you uncomfortable because it's that distortion of the familiar. And I think mm -hmm. that's like, that's the core tenement of horror, right? Like that's why you know, uh, every culture has zombies, right? Because it's 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 taking something human and making it unhuman, and and doing that in subtle ways is often more effective than doing it in a dramatic way. And I think like that, those quiet, horrific moments were the things that like really really struck a chord with me. Uh, but then also, I think just in general, the portrayal of Swamp Thing, of of like how he's drawn and how much emotion. Uh, they're able to get out of his face, you know, because he's inherently got an inhuman look to him. But, like, I don't know, like, how quiet, how meditative, how somber he is. Like, those are things that I've seen portrayed in a lot of drawings of him. But I think to actually read them in the context of a story and how it made me feel about him and how it made me connect to him and his emotionality – uh, was something that I wasn't necessarily expecting. Like, I was expecting to vibe with this book for its themes and its style and, and those things, but I wasn't necessarily expecting to, like, feel as much of a connection to 
Swamp Thing as a as a you know a, a quote unquote person. And I think the art was the biggest part of that. It's it was way more than his dialogue. The um, so when when uh, Ween was putting the the art team together, he had both Stephen and John submit pages. Um, one where they respectively uh, uh, penciled and then inked, and then they did the like vice versa. So like Bissett would Stephen Bissett would uh, pencil it, then John Tolliver would ink it, and then John Tolliver would pencil it. So like he could the, he could gauge who does what, and from that point on, he's like, okay, no, this is the way that the book has to be, and this is the way that the book is. So a lot of that came down to the way that um, the, the 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 power came from the way that he pres- wanted the team to dynamic to be and um i i think that's exemplified in for me in particular the inking it has these like hatching lines all the time like things aren't always yeah. formed they are like they're very loose figures they're like shadowy they feel like almost um like you're like you're draping a curtain on somebody and trying to like make up make something out of it um it was the biggest um when I was first reading it, it was the biggest issue I had because I, I, I was used to having the structure of like manga where the lines are straight, the like, like things are contained, but this was so loose for me that I, um, I, I loved and hooked onto the themes, but the art itself was uh, the most difficult part for me. And then, you know, subsequent readings as I've continued to do so, it's become one of the most, my most favorite parts and actually title bins inking itself um comes from some of the work again alluding to you know classics of, of art and literature from um gustave Doré, who is he's um he works in like wood wood blocks and uh, wood block inking and so the, the style here was mimicked in that to augment it from like an artistic perspective but also because the direction from ween was do something different do something weird and do something that's just like outside of the box and i think they they nail that Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> the um, uh, the other thing that I I wanted to ask you guys was about the colors and the lettering. So, the lettering in particular, uh, do you find his, uh, his speech patterns like annoying at all? Uh, not annoying. I think it, it's just like a, it's a quirk. You know, like it was a thing I had to get used to reading because like. I think the thing that tripped me up about it the most was not knowing what he sounded like in my head, mm. you know? Cause like, I, I think that's something that a lot of comic book readers will talk about, right? Where it's like, when I read Batman, like I hear Kevin Conroy, right? Like that's what Batman sounds like in my head. That's how he talks. So when I hear, like, I remember we talked about how like with Bendis's kind of robot Batman, like that clashed with how I hear him and that fucked it up for me. Whereas I think that was what I was trying to, I was like, is he pausing with the ellipses? Is, is it like, is he, is it lilting? Like what, what is Swamp Thing's voice? And I guess that was uh, the only kind of like barrier for me where it came to the, the lettering or, or any of like the, the delivery of his speech was just kind of like trying to find the rhythm of, of Swamp Thing. Bro, I hear Marco. Do you? <laughs> is that? That's not what that I hear. <laughs> yeah, man, you're the green. I am the green. I'm the green. I'm the jolly green giant, son. But a little Hell smaller. Yeah. Jolly green, regular size guy. <laughs> the um, uh, the colors are also like the the biggest thing. I think this was what for me signified like the horror, the dynamics in. Um, how you use it to fill the backgrounds, to um, to contrast certain events, the purples, the reds, like all this like classic shit was, I think for me, derived from Pope stuff. That was awesome. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it was great. Uh, use of color is so important. And oftentimes when we read a book for the show proper or in a book club, when an unusual color is used to kind of contrast uh, what's normal, it's often with great success and with, we often resoundingly praise it and it's really effective here. I think what's really cool about the colors in this book too, I think this is true of the art in general, but I think it's most obvious in the colors is that the art really, really serves the book. 
you know, and and like you you mentioned, Marco, how it kind of changes over the course of the the arcs, right? Like you look at like the swamped issue, and the palette for that is so much different than like for the stuff with Etrigan and and the monkey demon and everything. Like, yeah, and that I think is the thing that stands out to me uh, the most about the color is like I really really enjoy a book that feels dynamic. You know, like there's nothing wrong with having a feel or a sound or a, a style and like a lot of times that's a thing that will make me praise a book more than anything is if it has a vibe and and that vibe is appealing. But um, I think the sign of like a really, really great story and a really great creative team is when it can do multiple – it can play all these different kind of tunes and they all – don't like it feels harmonious, you know, like they feel like – they enhance each other by the mm. fact that they have a, a difference rather than giving you like whiplash of like, Oh, like this, this doesn't feel like Swamp Thing. It all feels like Swamp Thing, but it shows me that Swamp Thing can be deep horror. You know, it can be psychedelic. It can be bright and sunny. Like it can go where it needs to go. And, uh, and that, I think the colors do a lot of that heavy lifting because you know, it's the, the really, really horror issues are all about, you know, like having Swamp Thing bathed in in these black shadows and just seeing his eyes and his mouth or or seeing just, you know, parts of his obscured face versus like, you know, the the last issue of the arc, right? Where it's like he's outside, he's got the flowers growing on him, like he's or when he was in the sun and he's got his arms out. Like there's such a, an emotional range to to the book, you know, and, and the colors do a lot of that heavy lifting. Um, if you guys don't have anything else on the art, I did just want to address one more question from the discord before we get into like our final thoughts. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, so, uh, Kefus asked, you know, I know it's not part of this, the read for this, but I'd be interested in hearing closing thoughts on where Swampy went after this run. I'm a huge fan of the, of the Swamp Thing, this Swamp Thing. And I thought the first arc or so of the new 52 Swamp Thing was pretty solid. Um, so what I did was for the rest of this run, the Alan Moore run specifically, was I obviously wore my shirt, right? So this is issue 44, the gothic horror storyline that encompasses, um, if you want to get it, the next two trades after this. But hold on. Oh, my God. Oh, God, he has another shirt. He has a second shirt, everyone. I got the <laughs> next shirt. And this is when uh, this is issue 50, who is it? Where is it? 60? This is 60. Issue 60. Um, I've never where, seen this shirt before. Really? Um, this is where he goes into his space epic. So the last... <laughs> yeah, Wait, he goes to space? Bro, he, go, he goes to Ron. He goes to uh, yeah. like other planets. He interacts with the Green Lanterns. Like, is this still more? This is still more. Um, this okay. is everything that happens at in volumes 5 and 6. Um, so this is where he goes within this run. And then from there, you know, other writers take over Rick Veach, who was the, um, artist at, in the last two volumes starts to take over the storyline. He goes back in time. There's a whole bunch of other stuff with like other elementals. Um, Nancy Collins at one point comes into the story and brings back this like really Southern horror. That's really cool and fun. They just released, um, her trade and then, Mark Millar and Grant Morrison actually pick up the run um, mm. in the final in the final th like three volumes of the book. There's a Damn, there's a collected really? edition. Yep, that's cool. Um, I didn't know that. There's a collected edition for it if you guys are interested. Uh, it's not as great. It's like very very early Grant Morrison and Mark Millar. Um, but I mean, if 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 you're interested, I think it helps to round out the run. Uh, from here, the next series was actually uh by brian k vaughn he did about tefe which is the daughter um swamp thing and abby's uh, daughter and it's about her coming of age story her growing up a with you know the swamp thing as her her dad and whatnot um swamp daughter swamp daughter yeah swamp daughter. Uh, and so it, does she have swamp powers or is she just a person she has um <laughs> swamp powers she has it's the good. powers of the red and powers of um the green which christmas which christmas Whoa. 
which she tries to fight because they they starts to lead her down the path towards like a black kind of thing like uh, like a death kind of aspect because oh, okay. she can control both of those um so she's op she's op yeah she's op and she's like i'm a teen angsty teenager i'm gonna that's never good yeah um the, the uh the fourth series is written by andy diggle that one i only have the first trade for it's really hard to find it wasn't too popular and it deals with the aftermath of swamp thing after uh, mark millar's run where he's become this like superior being um and he's become like basically earth and he's just like a monstrous barbaric thing um and then the new 52 which is scott snyder charles so really good stuff i think that's probably my second favorite um volume of or third rather versus the, the first one um uh, cause it, it deals with a lot of, I think Sean mentioned, you know, some of the stuff that originated here gets dealt with and continued with in, in that run, you get new parliaments, which, um, we, we didn't get a chance to go over here, the parliament of trees. Um, but there's a lot there that gets explored as continuation of this original series, uh, specifically. Or this you should read all one. these books, man. You should read more Swamp Thing. I should bro, but it's, you know, it's just not good. So um so final thoughts what did you would you guys uh recommend this and what would you rate it it's excellent i mean it makes me want to read the rest of what alan moore had to put down um obvious like for obvious reasons this this is excellent this is great horror it's great like drama it's great philosophy um beautiful art this is everything that you would want in a comic book in many aspects as for what i recommend i think i think most of my friends would really enjoy a book like this i don't know if it's for everyone uh but that's okay not everything has to be for everyone and if i had to rate it i mean it's like you know this this was like a 8.8 out of 10 a 9 out of 10 something like that you know yeah, I, I feel very similarly. Uh, I think that this is this is some of the best comics work I've ever encountered overall. And I I guess, you know, if I had to knock it aside from the, the stupid love triangle, um, it would just be that for what we read here, I... I, I guess like I wish there was more, right? Like we didn't read enough to get mm. a full picture of, because Alan Moore continues, right? So like, yeah, I would love to know what happens next. Does his run live up to this standard that it set for itself, et cetera, et cetera. And that lack of knowledge definitely knocks this down a peg for me versus other things that I might have rated higher, but I would still give this a nine. And as far as a recommendation, I feel like it's a little tough to get into if you're a new reader, especially because you're coming into clearly what is, you know, intended to be a, a continuation of a prior story in a certain way. And there will be missing context for you, especially because Swamp Thing is not a popular character in the same way that, you know, let's say, you know, the X-Men are. So even if you come into house and powers and you don't know what the hell's going on you're still able to root yourself in oh well that's wolverine i know him or that's gene gray or whatever uh, it's a little tougher to do that with this but that being said i think this is tremendous anybody who's looking for a very 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 good comic book in general should buy this uh if you're looking for great 80s comics you should buy this uh there's there's all the reason in the world to pick it up if you're initiated yeah yeah i I totally agree with what you guys have put down i i would say i would rank it in in the similar range like you know nine you know i don't know maybe a little bit higher than that on a good day um i i think that this book is uh is really really exemplary work you know it, it it it's you know it doesn't need to be said that Alan Moore is one of the greatest comic book writers of all time, but every time I reread a piece of his work or read a piece of his work that I haven't experienced, I kind of have that thought again. 
Um, and this was definitely no different. So I think if you have enjoyed uh, any of his other work and you're willing to engage with something that takes a little bit more effort, uh, I would highly recommend it. But I, I think because of that fact, it's the kind of thing where I would highly recommend it to a very specific kind of reader. And if you're – yeah, right? Marco's raising his hand. Um, and I can think of plenty other of, of my friends who are, you know, uh, like deep in comics that haven't read this that ab- I will absolutely be recommending it to. Um, but for all the reasons that we laid out, you know, obviously it, there, there are some barriers to entry. Um, but I think if you're willing to do a little bit of that legwork or just walk in knowing that you'll be a little bit confused at first, you, you know, uh, you'll get there really quickly, I think, just because of the overt quality of the book um, mm-hmm. across the board, right? Like on an artistic level, on a narrative level, um, on a on a just page level, um, it's it's really special stuff. And it, it it very much affirms my bias that I think this is the best era of comics. Um, or at least my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, this is 10 out of 10 for me. This is huh? what I... Yeah, you know, believe it or not, I would have given it an 11, but the scale's at 10. <laughs> no, but this one goes up to 11, Marco. This one does go up to 11. That's how fucking 80s it is. Um, <laughs> so the... Uh, uh, yeah, this is basically what what I... Uh, like like the bar for me on for, for certain things. Um for certain comics and i think it is what brought me into the into the medium and like sort of pointed me in in different directions because there's a different character to this there's a different sort of uh approach and i think because of that it, it it painted what i what i enjoy about the comic book medium as well as what I enjoy about superheroes, even though something's not a superhero. But, oh, you just admitted um, that he's a superhero. Though. No, I don't. Nope. I, just I clarified it. Sorry. Uh, and mm. what um, what what the medium can do. Like th- this is a, a strong example of that. And um, hopefully down the line, I definitely want to do you know the rest of these runs because they're just as, in my opinion, just as strong, if not better. I think the the next run after this is pretty lauded as the epitome of swamp thing and uh the swamp thing story for more tell me it gets better um, than this that's great yeah yeah so uh, i definitely want to return to it at some point and with that listeners thank you so much uh please send in any questions about this any clarifications anything you want i love talking about swamp thing so give me all the more reason to do so uh the send us an email the comics pals at gmail.com facebook instagram twitter at the comics pals hit us up uh join our discord that's the best and probably easiest way to get to us to to talk with us if you want to recommend another book club if you want to tell me why this one's probably the best one if we've ever done like go ahead man like i'm i'm up for it get out of here phil um (laughs) what did you read superman what was it was something superman um All all right Uh, But yeah, uh, thank you guys. And until the next book club. Take care, guys. See you next month. So when's the uh, actual book club start? Oh, um, give me like 20 minutes. I got to go to the bathroom really quick.